I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, dude. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, let's uh, let's look at the next slide and learn about you. Sure. Okay. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a senior program manager at Microsoft, working on web development tools. Uh, one of the big things that I'm working on right now is a new project system for ASP.NET. So when you do file new project and you know all the Solution Explorer integration and integration with build and publishing, um, you know those are the main things uh, that I'm focused on uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, <clears throat> besides that, you know I've got a big background in MS Build and written a few books on MS Build in case anybody's interested. Yeah, in man, that. you wrote four books on MS Build. Four books. And you snagged the right. msbuild.book.com yeah, domain exactly, from right. all yep. the other people. The one and only. Yeah, there was so many people that was just, I, it was very difficult to get that <laughs> Both domain. of those other people writing books about yeah. MS Build. Yeah, it was very problematic <laughs> yeah. to acquire that domain. <laughs> cool. All right. And I'm still me, so there's my slide about myself. So I'm going to have one of those every show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's, do, let's dig into Visual Studio Tooling. Oh, we talked with Daniel Roth, and he went through some of the basics of what's going on in MVC uh, 6 and ASP.NET 5. But now we're going to kind of up-level a little bit, and we're going to look at Visual Studio Tooling. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So um, one, of the, one of the big things that I'm going to basically kind of try to bring home is the fact that we have spent a lot of time uh, making sure that Visual Studio kind of will get out of your way uh, when necessary. So what I mean by that, uh, if you're building um, ASP.NET 4 projects with Visual Studio 2013, uh, the mantra there was basically, uh, if you want to create ASP.NET applications, you have to use Visual Studio, and you have to do things in a particular way. Um, and if you ever went outside of that workflow or tried to use any additional tools, you might run into some, uh, some problems and some pain points. Uh, so, for instance, having all the files listed in the CS proj or VB proj is one problem. So, uh, if I used a tool like, let's say, Grunt or Bower or Yeoman to generate any files, I'd have to then make sure that I somehow was able to update my CS proj and VB proj to have those files listed as well. Um, with ASP.NET 5, the K proj doesn't have any files listed. Um, so, if you have any uh, third-party tools that are creating files, they'll just automatically become a part of the project uh, and things will just work. <clears throat> and then we'll take a look at some other areas uh, that the Visual Studio tooling has improved, uh, like we've listed here, like IntelliSense and uh, the configuration system is different. And then we have this concept of commands as well. Yeah, so I want to dig into that more than uh, we saw with, uh, with Dan. Exactly, yep. <clears throat> All right, so I've got this uh, sample project loaded here. Um, let me open the, the folder that's containing this project, and then I want to show you uh, some files that are in that folder. Sorry, didn't, um, the folder didn't get open for some reason. Let me yeah. try that one more time. I didn't know you can do that. You're right-clicking and saying open containing folder on the, on oh, the yeah, folder. Oh, yeah, that's been there since like 2012, I think. Yeah, thanks that's for, for, thanks while, for yeah. pointing out that I didn't know that. Yeah, no, I'll, t I'll take all credit for that feature. Oh, yeah, so, that yeah, was I'm all you? Definitely nice. very happy we're able to, uh, to ship that for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. So, uh, so let's take a look at some of the files that we have here. Okay. Uh, we've got project.json and uh, package.json, which we'll actually look at those. Uh, but the file I want to show you here is this kproj file. Okay. So let me unload this, and then I'll show you uh, what's the contents of this file, and then why is it used. <clears throat> uh, so this is basically, it's a pretty much a bare bones MS build file. So if you're familiar with MS build, uh, the syntax will look pretty familiar to you. Um, the big thing to take away, there's no files listed here. So uh, if you've ever worked on a, a Visual Studio project before that was in a repository, uh, you might have run into a problem where merging this file has been uh, problematic. So let's say if we're working on the same project, and I add three files, and then you add four or five different files, uh, it was always like a merge problem, especially because the files are not alphabetically ordered. Yep. Uh, so you'd always have this merge problem on the CS Proj file. Well, and it's an XML file, and you got to make sure you close the tags correctly, exactly. and you got to isolate yep. certain lines, and it's a hassle because all you did was add a file. Exactly right. It's definitely a lot more uh, tedious than what it should be. Um, I'm happy to say that we finally were able to get rid of the list. Um, this file is pretty minimal. We've got like the IS Express port here, but. Uh, there is very little besides that. The important part is there's nothing that's critical to my application here. It's all just kind of data for Visual Studio to provide some extra features mm -hmm. uh, like IIS Express. So do I even need it? 
Um, you don't necessarily need it. Um, and I'll show you how Visual Studio can recreate the file in scenarios hmm. that you don't. But um, odds are you probably want your IS Express port to be the same every time you open it. So uh, in yeah. some scenarios, you're going to want to keep it, but it's not strictly required. Okay. Yep. So now let me show you what happens if I were to add a file um, to the project uh, from Windows Explorer. And, you know, this could be a... Um, We'll go into www root here, which is the location for uh, static files. Mm -hmm. Let's say I want to add a, um, a. Let's say I want to add just a simple HTML file here. Okay. Um, you can see as I'm typing here uh, that it actually starts showing up in Visual Studio. Uh, so I've got simple oh, wow. HTML, simple .html. So, so I didn't have to edit. Dan had talked about these file watchers. Mm -hmm. Somebody's really paying attention inside of Visual Studio. So what's going on? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So what's happening for every project uh, that you create, we actually will start a file watcher on that particular folder, mm. and then any folders or files that uh, that are added will automatically show up in Visual Studio. Um, the file watcher was actually too good at one point because uh, what we noticed was we were writing files into the folder and it would actually pick up like the temporary um, OS file name that were temporarily being used when we moved it and copied mm -hmm. the file. So we actually had to fine tune it. Uh, so we've kind of got this like the smart delay saying, hey, I've noticed that the file's been dropped here. I'm going to wait X milliseconds for other operations and then it kind of buffers uh, the changes and whatnot. So yeah. Yep. Does that mean that any file I put there has to be there? Can I have a file in that folder and exclude it? Uh, yes, you can. Yeah, that's a great question. Yep. And then that's actually uh, some of the features that we're working on right now, the mm -hmm. ability to exclude files from Solution Explorer. Um, I'm not sure if this build actually has it. This is like a daily build. Yeah, everyone's coming with um, daily builds, with we, which I think we appreciate, actually. So yeah, no, keep, I don't keep have it, it up. on this one. Yeah, I don't have it on this one, but... Where will um, that be stored, do you think, in the future? I'll show you where it's going to be stored. So project.json actually already has... Um, they already have the ability to exclude files from publishing and mm -hmm. exclude files from your project. Um, and I've just showed you that here in project.json. So we've got the exclude... Uh, option and then we have pack exclude. So if you had any CS files that you wanted to, that were just sitting there but you wanted to exclude them for yeah. uh, compile, you can go in and edit this file. Okay. Um, and then you're going to make it so we can do that and there'll be a gesture and it'll show up there. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So it yeah. really is a, a inverting the, the, the way we used to think about things. It's, it's include all by default. Yeah, exactly. Okay, right. cool. Yep, and you know, I think this is a way that um, it's much more, it's much simpler and much easier to use, and um, it's really simple for uh, any third party to integrate with ASP.NET now, because you don't necessarily have to understand our project. All you have to understand is, you know, hey, you've got this folder and these conventions, and then start parting on that. So, yeah, exactly. All right, cool. Yep. Um, so, yeah, exactly. So, we've got exclude here. Uh, that's exclude compile. And then pack exclude is to exclude anything from uh, publishing. Right, and we'll learn more about publishing in a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yep. But you'll have some right-click exclude from project, exclude from okay. uh, publishing later on as well. Yep, so that was that. Uh, while we're inside this file, why don't we take a look at, um, and we'll come back to the command support later on, um, but let's take a look at the, uh, the frameworks that are listed here. Um, and this actually, you know, a lot about ASP.NET is actually looking at experiences that we've had for a long time and, uh, and saying, hey, is this, is this the correct model for us to have uh, for these experiences? Um, and one good example, and another good example of that is how we, do, how we actually work with uh, target frameworks. So in the past, if you had a project or a library that you wanted to build multiple uh, that you wanted to build for multiple different target frameworks, uh, you would probably use build configurations, and what you would do is you would create one build configuration for every particular platform. So a build configuration would be like what, like debug and release? Debug and release, yep. And, and then, then you'd make it one for debug for For this Windows particular phone target. Or... Yeah, so let's say if you wanted to create something for some particular PCL variant, and you had four or five different one of those, you'd probably create four or five different uh, mm. debug configurations. A uh, good example of that is the Newton Solve JSON package. I think it has probably uh, eight or nine different uh, build configurations and you know eight or nine different um, set of artifacts that come out of that. Um, so the way that you would build that inside Visual Studio is you'd create the build configurations, 
uh, and then you would build. But unfortunately, in Visual Studio, you can only build for one configuration at a time. Uh, so in that model, if I introduce some code that only built on one or some particular subset uh, of those target frameworks, the only way that I would actually know that is to switch to that other build configuration, uh, build my project, get the error or warning, and then resolve it at that point. Um, with ASP.NET 5, we've pretty much turned that upside down as well and said, hey, um, I'm going to declare the different target frameworks that this project is interested in building. And then we're simultaneously going to build all of them. And if you have any uh, errors, um, we'll also represent those uh, to where you can see which target framework has the error. So do you get a union of all errors across all frameworks? Yes. Right. Yep. And then for errors that are the same also across the frameworks, we'll dedupe those. Mm. Uh, so in some case, you might end up with an error that says, hey, this particular thing is not available. Okay. Uh, so let me show you that. <clears throat> Uh, and then this kind of goes along with another uh, feature uh, that's called combined IntelliSense. So uh, let me show you what happens. Yeah, I think you, there you go. Yeah, let me show you what happens um, if I try to use a function or object that's only defined in one of those particular um, frameworks. So I'll just do a simple uh, string replacement. Okay, let me just, let's sit here yeah, for a second. Okay, yeah, so Dan here. Dan talked a little bit about this, but I didn't quite understand. Yeah, so what's happening is uh, now IntelliSense will show you all the methods which are available to you. What is um, the, so the, the little yield sign there? Yeah, so the exclamation point here, basically that's the, the symbol for warning. It says, hey, I've got some additional information here for these particular ones. Mm. Uh, let me, we could pick any one of these, but I'm just going to grab replace. Oh, I guess that's a bad example. All right, let's just go into clone. So now if I were to go into clone, oops. Yeah, Dan was having some trouble with this as well. I, that we saw it there. Ah, here we go. we yeah. saw it there, but we didn't see it on the method. Yeah, I'm not sure why. It should pop up when I'm actually on it. But um, in either case, let me zoom in on this, uh, and we can take a look at the result here. It says, hey, uh, the clone method uh, is available for ASP.NET 5, but it's not available uh, when we're running ASP.NET 5 on the core CLR. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, I'd have to basically determine that, you know, is my project going to be targeting the core CLR at some point? Mm -hmm. uh, if it is, then I can use um, I can use clone for the full .NET for desktop, but I'd probably have to do some type of pound if def for the uh, the cloud uh, the cloud optimize. What if you call clone right now? Just call it and then compile. Will we get a an error in the task manager, in the uh, yes, yep, the output somewhere? Yeah, we will. What is that going to look like? Look at it. Oh, wrong one. Sorry. Let me open up the uh, error list here. Oh, okay. Yep. And then if I were to, um, even though we're not no, oh, we are in that context though right now. So right now at the top top of the screen there in the upper left corner there by startup it says we are currently on core five. And if you pull that down, and switch to on the full framework and do a compile. I think this will still, yeah, this will still uh, fail. And here it says project core five. Yeah, so exactly. it's telling you the context that it's running within. Yep. And so now, in this case, you're saying because you've chosen to target both, you have to really manage the errors for both because you decided you're targeting both. Yeah, exactly, yep, yep. Um, if, I wanna, if I wanted to go down to site to hey, core CLR, uh, is not interesting for me for this particular project. I can and bef start. Before you save that, go back over and, un and pin Solution Explorer for me and open up uh, references. So right now, we're building for both, right? Right. Yep. Okay, and then if you, you've just removed ASP.NET Core 5, so if you save that, what happens? It just disappears. That one goes away, yep. And that's a way of, you just edited an entire build configuration there. It wasn't, you didn't have to mess around in any dialogues, it just happened. Pretty much, yeah, exactly. That's pretty cool. It wasn't formally like what people normally consider a Visual Studio build configuration, ah, okay. but yeah, exactly, right. Yep. Okay, in this case, yeah, it's not a build configuration, but the essence was, right. the, the result is, now it's only compiling for yep. the one. That's right, yep. Cool. Yeah. Yep, so basically for every, so build configurations are defined over here. Okay. Uh, whether you're on debug or whether you're on release, we'll always build for every target framework that's listed in project.json. I see. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Let me uh, let me undo that change, and then I want to undo uh, this change here as well. Okay. 
And it won't, yeah, when you hit save, I guess it'll just pop back in, won't it? Yeah, it should just come back in, yep. And uh, let me show you how can we, uh, how can we pick a different uh, CLR to actually run with. So these are, you know, what's the CLRs that we're actually building with. All right. Um, so if we wanted to pick, if we wanted to pick a particular version that we wanted to uh, run with, so yeah. I'll show you that. Yeah, so I guess it's... Restore is completed, uh, then we can go and... That's restoring, presumably, from NuGet.org at this point. Exactly, yep. There we go. Now it's done. Right. Yeah. All right, so let's go into uh, properties. So our, um, our properties are kind of bare bones uh, right now, uh, but this is an area that we're... Uh, that we'll, we'll be beefing up in the next version, so you'll see a lot of additional properties, um, and then you'll be able to um, define what you're going to be debugging as well. Okay. Yep. So Come then, early next year. Yeah. So I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure when they're going to show up, but okay. Uh, yes, it should be pretty soon. Um, we also have a property to not uh, to whether you want to build uh, artifacts on disk or not. So I'll show you that as well here in a little bit. Um, but let's go to the uh, the application tab here, uh, where we've got all the target KRE versions. Uh, so these are the different um, versions of the CLR which are available to ASP.NET on this machine. And because you're a dev, uh, as well as PM, you're writing code too, you've got all sorts of daily, basically daily builds, don't you? Yep. Your own personal yep. daily builds of the core CLR. And it's interesting, if you look at the difference between Alpha 3 there, it was called Server 5.0, and then Alpha 4, we changed that name to Core CLR. So you've been tracking this for a while. Yeah, and you know, the fact is, um, these are, let me actually just show you where they're I only have two or three that. on my machine. Yep, let me show you where they're maintained at in mm -hmm. case um, you ever have the need to go through and delete it or. Uh, really, you can just go in a folder and delete it. That's all yeah. you gotta do. Yep, so I'm going to my uh, user profile folder. I'm gonna go into, whoop, I think it's just the right user profile, and then go to KRE, and then packages here. So uh, everything that I'm, everything that's listed here mm -hmm. is actually a folder. Um, in this directory here. So uh, you can just delete the whole folder, and then uh, next time you install the ASP.NET command line tools, it'll just bring down, um, I think, two particular, two packages for every install. Mm -hmm. Yep. Go ahead and go into one of those folders real yeah. quick. Okay, sure. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and go into one of these folders here. So you've got the, uh, the NuGet pack, and the uh, spec, and then the files are just laid out as well. So that's where that's the NuGet package unfolded. Yeah, exactly. So here you can see, uh, if you saw Dan Roth um, was uh, executing some of the command line tools, we can see those tools are actually in these folders here. So when you execute the kpm.cmd, uh, that's in this folder. Uh, k.cmd is in this folder. Uh, and then klr.exe, which is, uh, that's what it's used to host your app, is all contained uh, inside these folders. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, perfect. So let me... Um, I guess now that we're kind of talking about this list here, we can also uh, we can also get the list from the command line. And as we show you um, as we show you command line scenarios, the thing to keep in mind is uh, Visual Studio. If you're a Visual Studio user, you don't have to care about the command line. We'll take care of all that stuff. Um, but we want to show you that all the experiences that we're building in Visual Studio are basically built on top of command line experiences. The reason why we want to show you that is because then you can realize that it's easy for you to create your own kind of experience that builds on top of ASP.NET. And also, if you you know you didn't want to use Visual Studio for one reason or another, uh, you know it's possible for you to realize all the same goals with whatever tool set you want. Um, so as we show the command line, keep that in mind. You know those command line scenarios, if it's it's not required for the Visual Studio customer. So if you like using Visual Studio, definitely keep using Visual Studio, and you're not going to be forced to go into command line scenarios. So in a lot of demos, we're seeing people running around in the command line, a lot of demos of ASP.NET yep. 5, people are doing that. Mm -hmm. I think it's because we enjoy seeing what's underneath, we enjoy seeing the plumbing sometimes. Yeah. But right. it doesn't mean that yeah. the command line is required, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, command line is definitely not required, definitely added bonus, and you know, for some experiences, you might have a better experience on command line if that's the type of customer, if that's the type of experience that you like, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, we're not trying to force Visual Studio customers to go to command line, and we're not trying to force command line customers to go into Visual Studio either. You know, if you're comfortable with UI and uh, being inside Visual Studio, we want you to stay there. But if you're comfortable with command line tools and doing things more manually without tooling, 
we want to make sure that you can do those things and that you'll still have a really great experience with ASP.NET and all the other tools will just kind of get out of the way. And uh, we want to make sure those mixed uh, scenarios are uh, well supported as well. So let's say uh, if, if two or three of us are working together and uh, one guy's using Visual Studio and uh, the other guys are using Mac, you know, we should have a great experience uh, for those scenarios as well. And actually, that's a good uh, segue for me to move into a, uh, another demo of how Visual Studio will actually move out of the way. But uh, before we do that, let me show you on command line, how can we get the same list of those okay. uh, target frameworks? So I can do KVM list, uh, and then that'll show me uh, the different target frameworks which are available. Mm -hmm. And then I can even do KVM upgrade to download the latest version that's available. OK. Um, let me go back to my project. I'm just going to close the solution here. And then I'm going to go back into uh, the folder list here. And I'm going to just go through and delete all the files which were added by Visual Studio. So those are the kproj files, uh, the kproj.user file. And then I'll do the same for this uh, shared library. And uh, you know, I didn't uh, do a really great job explaining this project or this solution when I loaded it up. Um, it's a web project um, that's called multi-project here. Uh, and this web project has a reference. Um, it has a reference to a class library project, uh, which is here, shared library. Um, so now imagine, imagine that this solution was checked in on a Mac. Uh, and then I just um, clone the repository. Mm -hmm. And now I want to open. Now I want to. Oh, well, I'm having mouse. You lose your mouse here. there? My mouse. Uh, OK, now there it's, it goes. it's back. OK, back. sorry about that. Uh, let me copy this. So now I'm going to um, browse out to this folder, multi project, uh, go into source. Actually, let me delete the solution file too, just so that nothing is. So you're removing all of the Visual Studio parts yep. of the thing. Exactly, yep. Everything that Visual Studio created. So I'll do file open project again. Uh-huh. Uh, paste in the path. Multi-project. And then here I can see project.json. Okay. Let's watch the folder. All right, let me go into source, multi-proj. So it creates the kproj. Mm. And then when it discovers the class library, it should create the kproj for the class library as well. Oh, wow. So yeah, so in this scenario then, the Visual Studio user can either choose to check those files in, mm -hmm. or he can choose to just let it sit on his uh, box. So that's what I meant by, you know, the file is technically required by Visual Studio, but it will just create it when it needs uh, if it's not there. So the information there is non-critical information. And the person on the on the Mac or the other machine, they, they can run KVM list and KVM use and things like that, and we'll dig more into that with Lewis uh, next, uh, but the Visual Studio person gets that good experience. And it seems like that's a, kind of a theme throughout what's going on in Visual Studio. The tooling is letting you use the text files like project.json, but it's also updating the UI at the same time. So you can you know, do yep. your NuGets here, you can do them over in the GUI, you can do them in a text file. Yeah, exactly, yep. Back and forth. Yep. So th that's kind of a, a change in philosophy a little bit, wouldn't you say? I think so too, and it also kind of, um, it just kind of, you know, highlights the fact that we're really trying to uh, appeal to a wider set of audiences. You know, so before, uh, you know, we had managed NuGet packages, and um, you know, we had the dialogue there, uh, but we didn't give a really great experience for users who are directly editing uh, packages.config back then. Mm. Um, but now we say, hey, you know, I think that there's a large group of there's a large uh, number of people who like using the dialogue. But there's also a significant portion of folks who don't like using the dialogue, and they want to have uh, full control over what's happening and where things are going. Um, Visual Studio will be smart for you, but you know, in some cases, uh, it may not do exactly what you might have done. So for example, uh, when you add a NuGet package into your project, uh, we'll examine the available target frameworks and uh, if your package doesn't support the core CLR, uh, then we'll place it only in the uh, frameworks which do support it, so the full.NET for desktop or vice versa. 
uh, you know, there might be some scenarios where you said, hey, I don't want Visual Studio trying to be smart or trying to help me. I literally just want this particular string in this particular spot of project.json. And then we'll do everything that we can to help you, including like a really great experience with IntelliSense. Um, and then, you know, the UI responsiveness of showing it up in Solution Explorer and then helping you to have those gestures as well. So, yeah, it's kind of a, we're trying to basically appeal to a wider audience and trying to create tools for both, hey, I'm really geared towards UI, and then I'm really geared towards, I want to have absolute control um, over what's happening. Okay, yeah. what slides do we have next? Where are we Let's at? Let's take a look, okay. Let's go back. So uh, one thing that we didn't talk about here was the, uh, uh, there, there's actually two things I want to talk about. So one is config improvement and then support for the commands, which we haven't gone over. We talked a little bit about config improvements in Dan's section. So in the interest of okay. time, let's do the commands. Let's, let's skip over that one. Let's show these uh, commands real quick. Okay, so in project.json, um, when we were here previously, we saw these commands. Mm -hmm. um, let me take out the Solution Explorer here. So these commands, um, it's really you're your kind of exposing an entry point that your project has. And then uh, you're basically exposing that on the command line. Uh, so for this project, if I was on the command line, I can invoke a, either one of these commands, web, gen, or ef. And these mm -hmm. names are just completely arbitrary and chosen by whoever has created that command. So I could make test, maybe, yep. if I wanted to. Yeah, exactly. So what I'll do is, let me take one of these existing command. Let's take the web command, and let's say um, Scott Web. Let's say, for some reason, you wanted Scott Web. You, mean you have a, a need to add a quote at the beginning. Yep, sorry about that. And that might be like a different port, maybe, or something. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Let's say you wanted this to be on 5050 for some reason. OK. Um, so that's how that works. So let me show you what this does. So uh, this will create a command that's called web, and you can invoke that with k. So you do k space web. And then uh, this portion here just uh, defines the, uh, the entry point, basically. So what's the object that's going to be loaded up? Uh, and then these are just parameters that get passed to it. Um, so if your custom command had some you know, particular um, parameters that need to get passed through, you can go ahead and pass those through. Let me save this, and then I'll show you how can we execute those from the command line. We're just going to do a restore. I think everything's uh, been restored, but uh, just in case. So I'll do uh, k Scott Web. Oh, man. Just one second. You know, this actually is something. I'm, I'm going to show you this in a different way. Okay. I'm going to show you this in a different way. This is for that daily build, and there's something. Yeah, that's fine. There's something weird that's going on, but um, well, I'm so we've got we've got four commands here. We've got web, Scott, web, gen, and ef. Yep. Okay. So let me show you. Uh, let's say if you're a command author, and you need to debug one of your commands, let me show you how you can you do that real quick. Um, so right now, uh, it's just listed under the debug menu. Um, so if you wanted to load your project in IIS Express, right, which that's, is automatic. Default, that's automatic, uh, or you can pick Scott Webb here and then do an F5. So I'll show you that it actually, uh, it actually does work. Sure. Um, and then I'll show you how can we execute those uh, commands later on after we've published it. Uh, so here you can see it's doing something different than IIS Express. Here it just calls the uh, web listener right. and then runs it. You can think about this web command as like self-host. So if you wanted to have self-hosting, that's where you would leverage this web command. I use that example of test. Is that a silly example? To have no, that's it? actually a, a great example. Um, and this machine is not ready for it, but uh, you actually could uh, run unit tests, and it actually is with a command that's called test. And if I wanted to be even more creative, I could use like Selenium tests or uh, Phantom JS or some kind of you know unit testing framework and launch browsers. I can write one of those myself. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So the um, I should have actually gotten the uh, unit test ready on this machine, but it's okay. Uh, but anyways, uh, the way that that actually works is is very generic. So the Visual Studio support of that goes through K test. Um, what I mean is, when you open a uh, ASP.NET Five project, uh, the way that we'll recognize that hey, this project has test cases is if uh, there's a test command inside that project. 
And then the, uh, the Visual Studio Test Explorer is actually populated through the command line as well. Wait a second. Are you saying that if I have a command called test, that's a magic name, and you'll recognize it? Yes, but you have to you'll have to implement a couple other things too. That's cool though. And uh, I, I could probably that. I could probably throw a blog po blog post out about how to do it. But let's do it. Um, yeah, I can. I'll, yeah. I'll totally do that. So keep an eye on the uh, web dev blog. You can just search for web dev blog, and it's yeah. usually the first hit. But awesome. Uh, yeah, as long as you're so basically the way that it works is uh, if there is a command that's called test, we'll add that into the test explorer. And then we call uh, another command line to actually get the test cases. So it's ktest dash dash list dash dash design time or something like that. Okay, cool. And that populates the uh, test explorer. And then when you execute them, right. we'll just call ktest. And if you pass a specific one, we pass that specific one. So uh, the actual code for testing your project could be totally different and uh, something which maybe is a total one-off to your scenario. But as long as you have that test name, and you've got those same uh, switches for your command line, then everything should just work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, yep. And of course, like you said, a reminder, not only is this daily builds that you we're looking at here, but it's all changing. You can see that this is very bare bones property dialogue right now, but yep. soon it's gonna be even have even more. And I, I personally think that the command stuff has a lot of flexibility more. I mean, there's probably commands we haven't even thought of that someone could put in here that they might use for their applications. I think the command stuff is absolutely incredible, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, like, we're building experiences on top of commands already. So te unit testing is one. Uh, scaffolding is one. Yeah, Entity Frameworks uh, migration. Yeah, Entity Framework migration. Uh, actually, hosting your app is one. But, you know, there could be y a lot of other stuff. And, you know, it's really just kind of interesting. You could almost kind of create a customized menu for your project. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you wanted to have your own custom commands there. And well, then I'm interested in figuring out a way to do JavaScript unit testing. So you'd have your server-side unit tests and your JavaScript unit tests and being able to run those the, using the commands. Yep. And since Visual Studio, as you point out, under debug target will allow you to call those directly, everybody, yes. you know, everybody yeah, wins. Yep. So it's a lot of extensibility. Yeah, it's real simple to try it out. Yeah, in a future build, uh, those commands will show up directly in the... That was my um, next question. They're going to show up directly in the debug dropdown. So somewhere there'll be, a, you also have browsers, different browsers to choose right. from. So there'll yeah. be a way to say to yep. different browser and whatever target you want. Yep. Yep. So yep. this target on that browser. So you'll be able to pick your command, and then you'll be able to pick your browsers as well, just like what you have today. All right, yep. cool. Yeah. So you talked about KVM and K, but let's talk about packaging and publishing. Sure. Okay, cool. So let me, let me, um, let's hit the slide real I'll quick. show you, okay. Just as a, as a bookmark for our friends. No problem, yep. All right, so packing and packing and publishing. Right, so now this is the section where we'll talk about packaging and publishing. Um, so very briefly, I'll show you that we have some command line tools for this. Um, and then um, I'll show you uh, what's the experience from Visual Studio, mm -hmm. and then kind of give you a hint of uh, what's going to be coming next. Cool, and then Lewis is going to dig into some of the command line stuff, so don't worry, we will cover this. Yep. But with you, I want to focus on uh, some of the cool stuff that's in Visual Studio that's going to make this easier. Okay, so let me just skip over the, uh, the command line part, but uh, if you wanted to publish a... Uh, a project from the command line, you'd use KPM pack, and then Lewis will show you that. Okay. Uh, let me show you. Um, I think I have another. And you owned project. publishing tools in Visual Studio, didn't you? I do. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm definitely. Yeah, publishing is definitely one of my uh, sweet spots. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now for um, ASP.NET 5, we're supporting uh, Azure websites and file system. Uh, we will have generic MS Deploy support. <clears throat> it's actually generic already, but uh, you need a new version of MS Deploy, which none of the hosters have installed. So, um, What about like publishing to IIS? Which one of these would that be? Uh, you would just import it there at that point and just create the, uh, the profile manually. Okay. Yeah. But later on, we'll have all the same different options as what we had before. Okay. Yep. So in this case, let me just publish out to the file system. So I'm just going to create a web publish profile. Uh, let's create a new folder here that we can publish to. Alright, publish. And then let's create a new folder here. So I'll say MVA. Okay, okay. and we'll just publish to this folder here. And publishing is more than just copying stuff into a folder. This is what's interesting to me. Because this is, it's, it's build, it's packaging, it's, it's reconciling all the 
dependencies. It's, it's quite a bit more than just if people think, oh, this is just copying the files over there. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, it's definitely build, and, um, <clears throat> and then it will transform your uh, project uh, to where it's ready to be hosted on IAS. Uh, with that being said, uh, we really, Visual Studio is really relying on KPM Pack. Mm -hmm. So kind of think about it in this sense. So Visual Studio, the publish, will basically, Visual Studio Publishing will call KPM Pack, and then it will take the outputs of that and then just transport that over whatever transport protocol that you had. So MS Deploy, File System, FTP. Ah. Um, but we're really relying on that KPM Pack, and then um, we just take the folder and then the publish settings, and then we just publish that. So let me show you how that works. Um, so I just created a file system profile and then click the publish button. Um, if I were to go back up towards the top There's of There's a lot of MS build stuff there. Yeah, you know, this actually, uh, for normal people, they wouldn't see all this. Um, You've turned on a lot of messages. debug, I think. Yeah, so in my options menu, um, under projects and solution, I've just turned this to detailed. So if you had it set on minimal, you'd get a much uh, user friendly, you'd get something sure. that much well, more. Well, uh, you're user the guy friendly. that builds this stuff, so I can see why you'd want detailed. Yeah, no, these messages are definitely uh, very important to me. Um, but if I could, if if I was on minimum, we would see that it's calling. Yeah, it'd be about right KPM there. KPM pack. Yeah, it'd be somewhere here. Uh huh. Uh, but that's okay. Um, but look at that. There, hang on though. Look at the bottom there. Mm -hmm. Publishing file ef.cmd gen.cmd web.cmd. Yep. And that's exactly what I was going to show you. Ah, great so minds, now great minds. We've got the uh, the command files here, so I'm going to go into just get a reset. Uh, oops, sorry. All right, so now if I wanted to run it, I can just execute these uh, commands. Oh man. Yeah, I think you. This is where that um, you have a local build problem. It's a uh, yeah yeah my path is. Um, Screwed Maybe uh, KU's default? KU's default? I don't think so. And then try it again? Oh. No, it's something else. But, no worries. Um, but I think try the... it from a normal command prompt. It might actually work. But Okay. Um, but for people who just have the regular... Who uh, aren't running dailies, I think. Yeah, who are not running fine. the daily stuff, this is totally going to work for them. Oh, man. Yeah, it's some, like, weird path issue going on. It's okay. Machine, so go back over to the, the folder there, and let's talk about this. So yep. ef.command, gen.command. Go ahead and open up web.command for me in Notepad. So see what that's doing. It's, it's, it's actually from the current folder. It's going into the packages folder where all your NuGet packages are, and it's calling the... The runtime there. It's the hosted the the thing that hosts ASP.NET. Yep. And then if you scroll to the right a little bit, and then it just tells where yeah. your app is. Here's where the app is, and, then, and it's hosted here. And then there's your these there's are your the web. parameters that were inside uh, project.json. So then if I made test like we talked about theoretically test, we would get a test.cmd. Yep. And all of that gets wrapped up. So if you go ahead and close uh, Notepad and go over into your packages folder there. Go up, yeah, there you go, app root, packages. It brought in all of the dependencies. And this is what we, what we mean when we say you get your own custom .NET framework, basically, don't you? Like, this is exactly what you wanted. Self-contained, no more, no less. Just those, it didn't copy the entire .NET framework over, just what you wanted. Yeah, exactly, yep, that's right. And then uh, if you go into app root, then really briefly, I can see in packages that you've got uh, your own, the, the KVM, the, the, excuse me, the, the core CLR beta 2 and beta 1 there, the ones that you wanted to use. Right. Yep. Copied over here. And when Scott uh, Hunter at the very beginning talked about how your version of your application won't hurt someone else's, you can now deploy this to Azure or IIS or whatever on someone else's machine and not worry about messing up anybody yeah, exactly. else. Yep. Yeah, because you're just loading from that particular file, and you know you're not modifying any shared files or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Out of curiosity, just uh, for my ed education, if you go up one more, how much, uh, how big is the packages folder right there? Uh, for AppRoot? Yeah, let's just look at that big that is. Probably like 40 megs, I would imagine. I it's probably a little bit. Oh wow, 24. 25 megs. Yeah. So your own kind of private, just what I need version of the .NET framework. 25 megs in this, right. in this example. In this particular example, yep. That's pretty sweet. 
It's not bad. I mean, it definitely fits on every uh, SD card that I have or thumb drive, you know? Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, let's, um, you know, uh, the next section is selecting a CLR, and you've been having some trouble with your command line. Do you want to try switching over to mine? Yeah, let's do that. Let's try that yeah. real okay. quick. So I'm going to do a little beep boop bop boo here. Click, click, click. And we're going to switch over to my giant tablet, which I've just been using to play uh, Angry Birds up until now. Right. I just Now that I see both of us in the screen, it's like Battle of the Beards. <laughs> Is it really a battle, though? I'm not really trying that hard. To... Mine's pretty gray. Mine's grayer, dude. Yeah, well, that's the tragedy, isn't it? All right. So uh, here's, uh, here's my machine, and I'll bring up uh, a, a more public version of the framework, right? Right. Yep. Something that more people... Yeah, this is what you all have, exactly. not, uh, not daily build, and, and, and this will probably crash too, though. But I'm sure. Just, just to lower your expectations now. That's still a daily build, too. It's just been, you know... Uh, no, this, well, I guess it's a day. It was just a good day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Okay, so I'm, I'm making a, uh, a project here, and then at the same time, I will bring up a f much too large font here. There we go. Okay, so there's my command prompt. And here's Web Application 16, okay? And if I go to project.json, here's some commands. And there's a bunch of words that I'm not allowed to use. So I will not use those words. What am I allowed to use? I can't even think of words. Pants. Because I always get in trouble for saying things I'm not supposed to say. So uh, here, whenever you change your project JSON, of course, references changes there. I'm going to right click. I'm going to say publish. Like, just like you did, file system, and I'll stick it uh, on the desktop, we'll say. I don't actually... Uh, it'll create it. It'll create it for me? Yeah. Oh, pants does not exist. <laughs> uh, and then here you go. See? Yep. Right? Okay. Hit publish. Now, while that's happening, now I have a tiny... DOS prompt. I have a batch file called desktop. Everyone should have one. Now that's empty. Now it's full with pants. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, exactly. So site published type pants. There it is. And let's type pants. See, look at that. So there is that, and then here let's bring up a uh, non-threatening competitive browser. And uh, of course, everyone knows I Bing. Uh, five thousand one, five thousand. Let's try five thousand. It's one of the. Oh, look at that! See. Yep. Boom. Yeah, and that's using that self-contained uh, CLR. You know, it shouldn't be going right, outside right. of it at all to get anything. And then to expand on that, because I have a little bit different system than you do. If I say KVM list. That's using yep. this version of the beta uh, of the CLR, and I've also set up some aliases here. Now, if I understand correctly, if it's called default, that's the one Visual Studio uses. Is that correct? Right. Right. And then that's stored in a text file under your users directory. You know, that's a great point. Let's go and look at that. So, if I go to users, Scott, uh, KRE. Yep. Yeah. Dot KRE. Yeah. Dot KRE. Uh, I can't type. KRE. Right. Alias. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Yeah, and right now you're seeing a default and it looks like you have a core as well. I made it I made one called core right. just to see what it would happen. Mm -hmm. And I made that the core CLR. So then I can go and say KVM use core. But again, I don't have to do any of that because I can go back over here and just right click properties mm -hmm. and that is my same list. That's right. Yep. Yep. And uh, so so in, uh, in the current version, uh, Visual Studio will just directly use that default alias. Mm -hmm. um, we're thinking about uh, creating a new alias for every version of Visual Studio. So there may be a Visual Studio 2015 alias that shows up later oh, on. Oh, that's or an interesting idea. 2015.0. Uh, so, so then if this, I would be, be able to say KVM use and then, you know, VS 2013 or 2015 or 2015 dot whatever. dot zero. Yeah, probably. yeah. Yep. So that's what we're kind of thinking. So that way you know that uh, what's the version 
that kind of goes along with mm -hmm. the Visual Studio. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. Let's uh, let's go over here now and talk about NuGet and Project Jason. We'll keep using my machine for now while okay. we uh, have Sounds stuff good. working. Is that yep. okay with you? Yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. Yep. So here we've got this dependencies folder here. Right. No, and then we've got references. What's the difference between these two? Um, well, they're pretty similar. Uh, I guess I'd say the big difference is one of them has some history and the other one uh, is pretty new to ASP.NET. Uh, but, you know, conceptually, uh, they're pretty similar, you know, and I think um, in this particular build, we're seeing that dependencies and references are kind of sp uh, split out. It's kind of like client side um, and server side, and we'll talk in the next module about this client side mm -hmm. bit. Yep. Here, these are, I thought was really interesting are, uh, this is a dependency chain, isn't it? Yeah, if you take a look at it, uh, one of the big differences uh, from previous versions of ASP.NET uh, and ASP.NET 5 is uh, when you add a NuGet package, mm -hmm. uh, what does that do to your project? Uh, so in previous versions, if you install a NuGet package, uh, when you install that package, that package gets installed in your project mm -hmm. um, as well as every dependency that that project has. That that package has. Right, that that package has. Yeah, sorry, that that package has. So right. uh, the result is uh, you'll do install package, and then maybe it adds five NuGet packages, and then it updates packages.config. So at the end of the day, uh, you cannot tell a difference between packages which were explicitly added uh, versus packages that came through as a dependency. You know, that's um, a really good point. I never thought about that. You'd add one, and then you right. go back later to look at your packages.config, and there's 20 new ones. You're like, yep. I don't know. Yeah, and then you just end up with a whole bunch of NuGet packages, which your app may or may not be using. Right. Uh, so to resolve that problem, um, in uh, project.json, you just add the top-level dependency. Okay. And then uh, any other dependency will automatically be brought in. So when you remove a dependency, there's nothing really to delete because its dependencies won't get loaded up. Well, if I go, let me ask you this. If I go open file in Explorer here, and I go up a bit, where is my, where it's are in my? Your, uh, user, it's in user, it's in a sibling folder to .kre, it's .kpm. Ah, so I'm not actually kind of quote unquote littering right. my system yeah. with uh, a lot of those things anymore. Am yeah, I? like one time, this was about a year back, um, you know, I've got these laptops and, you know, I put SSDs in these laptops and, you know, mm -hmm. SSD can never have enough space until maybe just recently, but um, in either case, my SSD was always being, uh, I was always running out of space on the on the hard drive, right? So I wrote this PowerShell script to just go and uh, figure out all the bin folders and all the packages folders and mm -hmm. then how much was it across my entire machine. I executed the script, and this was with uh, the previous version, right? I right. executed it, not even exaggerating, it was like 9 or 10 gigs. Mm. And they're just the same and mostly files repetition. copied over yeah. and over and over again. Uh, so now we have a consolidated folder where all NuGet packages for ASP.NET projects go to, and that's inside the uh, user's KPM folder. Okay, but this is not, and forgive me, a global assembly cache. No. Even though it's global and it's a cache right. and there's assemblies in it. Right. <laughs> no, yeah, because the GAC had, you know, GAC, even though it was global and it was a right. cache for assemblies, it actually had a lot more to it yeah. than that, too. Like and the GAC was for runtime and policies yeah. and stuff like that. This is literally just, yeah. let's put all the nougats in one place yep. so and if, we save and space. And if you delete those files, next time you do a restore, they will just be downloaded. Oh, really? Again. Oh, okay. And I, I actually recommend people to go through and delete this folder every once in a while. Just tidy up. If you've had like previous versions of Visual Studio installed, and well, yeah, well, look if you're here. installing multiple versions, just delete that folder every once in a while. If I go here and I say ASP.NET MVC, I can see I've got older builds there. Yep, and yeah, you definitely want to go through and get rid of those. Interesting. Uh, yep. Okay, so if I went here and I said, Jason, could I go and do this? Would this work? Search remote NuGet packages for Jason? It should work, yeah. And then I could find, I think it's Newtonsoft, Newton actually. Newtonsoft, yeah, exactly, yeah. Because that's our buddy there, Newtonsoft. Yeah. Yeah, he's there. He should be there, yep. I was searching for this earlier, and I think there might be some hiccups on the 
uh, the remote filtering on NuGet.org right now. Did we? Do so we? Is it everyone but Newtonsoft? Is that what's going on? Are we hitting the, the everyone but Newtonsoft thing? So let me ask you this. Let's try this. Rather than doing it from the command line, which appears to be having some kind of a yeah, package manager console will show it appropriately. Yep. Well, I can also I can do it that three different ways, couldn't I? I can do it here, right? Manage NuGet. Well, not add reference. Pardon manage me. Manage NuGet. Manage NuGet. Packages, Thank right? you, sir. Uh -huh. And uh, I think it's probably a very popular one, so it should show up. Uh... Yeah, it'll show up right at the top of this list for sure. Yep. But on the um, on the querying in particular, we have some server side yep. uh, bugs that will be. So this is new. It shows me the latest yep. stable, which is nice. Mm -hmm. So I can pick that one, and let's see if I hit uh, preview. It'll tell me what it's going to do, and it'll also show me that it has no dependencies. If I hit install right. now. Where is that going to show up? It should show up in this file. Oh, look at that. That showed up here. OK, see what I was saying about how yeah. sometimes Visual Studio is trying to be smart for you? So this is one of the cases where. Is this, is this not a smart thing it did? I don't, I don't know. I'd have to actually look at that package. I see. But it either, basically it said, here's the, right the core thing or version. Or did the of wrong that. thing. One yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Here's the core version of that. But that's pretty cool. Yep. So one other interesting thing with regards to NuGet that maybe I could have you speak to while you're here, and I'm going to just put this back the way it was. There we go. Break as few things as possible here. That's no, this is no doubt completely broken at this point. Let's see if this thing still runs. Is um, everything's a NuGet package now, isn't it? Pretty much, yeah. So if I, this is still running. Here we go. If I went up here to GitHub slash ASP.NET slash MVC, right? Here's the source code for MVC. And I went to the branch here yep. and put in, say, beta, because I'm on beta, right? And then said download zip and downloaded this stuff. Uh -huh. Then um, I could take my, my MVC zip file this beta file here, right? right? Yep. And inside this is the source code. That's the actual source for, and all the tests, by the way, too. <clears throat> Could I go like this? Basically, uh, open up my folder for my project in Explorer here, and then just basically take MVC and stick it over here. Right. Yeah, and then it should. Yep. But but all this and all this here is uh, this is all NuGet though, right? I'm asking for NuGet packages of well NuGet. Yeah, so the concept we wanted to uh, kind of bleed the concept of a NuGet package and a project, and um, we want to make these things to uh, be equivalent, mm -hmm. right? where wherever you're using a NuGet package, you should be able to replace that with a project. Mm -hmm. Yep. So even though those things look like NuGet packages, you're never actually declaring the hey. This is in a NuGet package. You're just declaring what is the dependency, and then the resolver will figure out is it a NuGet package or is it an actual source project. Ah, so when I right. said dependencies here on line five, I didn't say NuGet. NuGet package, right. But I kind of do, though, in the sense of even a folder can be a NuGet package. And when you pack this thing up, it becomes a NuGet package. It's kind of it's NuGets all the way down. Yeah, exactly. Like shared libraries at the bottom of that list, I think, you know, and that's a project reference. Or, uh -huh. or that was a, oh, sorry, that was my project that I had it. But uh, yeah, if you had your, if you had a regular project reference, it would just show up right next to the NuGet packages. Right. So now I've got MVC itself. Just sitting here. So if I understand correctly, let's say that I didn't like something in Microsoft ASP.NET Diagnostics or perhaps something broke or I found a cool bug. Right. I could bring that down locally. And you didn't add every one of those projects to your solution. Yeah. Those were added by the resolver, basically. You copied the files, and then you probably modified project.json, mm -hmm. and then when it reloaded it, it said, oh, this is a project now. Let me go and yep. load the project. Yep, exactly. absolutely. Yep. That's right. And then one last thing that we want to hit as we head out here, are we saw the server side stuff, right. NuGet. Let's look a little bit just briefly at the client side stuff. These are other package managers. So here we've got dependencies, Bower, which yep. is a place where we get mm -hmm. uh, client side JavaScript, right? Yep. 
and then NPM where we get tools and things like that, and then in, in some cases also packages. Yep, if I go to bower.json, this is kind of like packages.json, uh, mm -hmm. isn't it? It is, right. Yep, and we've got some really nice IntelliSense here as well. Yeah, it's telling me where it came from. Exactly. I can even go here. This blew me away. I can say open home page in browser. Yep, and some of this, I think, is coming from Web Essentials. I'm not sure what. I know this pretty is. bird yeah, is coming from, from Web, Essentials. Web Essentials. So, yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's a good idea to install Web Essentials anyways, but yeah, yep. definitely for the folks that's out here, if you see something that you don't see in your own build, go and install Web Essentials. Right, Web Essentials is kind of our labs. And then the last thing we wanted to talk a little bit about was Grunt, which is kind of like, uh, would you say, MS Build for the client. Exactly, right. And what I think is really particularly nice is, you know, here's your, your Grunt file that says, hey, I'm going to go and lay out my www root, and I'm going to minify my JavaScript and my CSS, and uh, you know, minify my CSS. Uh, this is your client-side build that preps your CSS and your JavaScript. Right. But you, as an MS Build person, appreciate this. I could go here and say, bind this client-side build thing to something on the server side. So basically, when MS right. Build's done building, run this task. Right, yeah. It's a really think, nice integration. I think right now it's more Visual Studio versus MS Build, but yeah, we'll get to the MS Build part later okay, on. Okay, so right now that binding is a Visual Studio-ism? Right. Well, does that go in the Kproj? Uh, no, it actually goes as a comment in the Grunt file. So that, because keep in mind, Visual Studio may or may not be in the picture. Oh, that's a good point. Right. I think this is really a nice integration, though, yep. to be able to do that. So we've got the Task Runner Explorer that lets you get to Grunt. Yep from inside of the Visual Studio tooling. And then do you know, did you explain how these are kicked off? So go back into project.json, and then there's a scripts uh, section here. Yep, there it is, right that's there. How, that's, Pardon me. That's the, uh, the glue, Oops. in case anybody was wondering. So that's how, if you have people that are doing command line scenarios, like KPM pack, yeah. they automatically get called. And uh, I KPM noticed that restore. when you did a restore, it also called npm install, which yep. is their restore. Exactly right. Yep, so that's how it's kind of glued together. So there's no magic here. Yep. Very cool. All right. We learned all sorts of great tooling and fun stuff for ASP.NET 5. We did, I think. Yeah, totally. Thanks for yeah. uh, spending the hour with us. Sure, yeah, thanks. It was great being here. We will be right back after a short break with even more here on Microsoft Virtual Academy. Mm -hmm.